welcome to Coffee and Crime. I'm Stephanie, the Adult Programming Coordinator. Um, tonight, we are going to talk to Dr. Peter Cohen, uh, Senior Lecturer in Religion at Clemson University. Um, and we will be discussing the book, Broken Faith and Cults. Um, before we dive in, I did want to say uh, we will be, if you post a question in the comments, Ninja, whoops, there we go, that way. <laughs> Ninja Warrior Coffee House um, is donated a, a $5 gift card for some coffee. Uh, so we have some coffee with our crumb tonight. So if you leave a comment, you're going to be entered into a drawing to win that coffee. Um, the book we are talking about is Broken Faith, um, which is for those that haven't read it, just so that you know a little bit before we really get in. Um, it's predominantly about a Coop, the Cooper family and many others as they join and leave uh, the world of faith fellowship. Uh, Jane Whaley is the founder and prophet of the world of faith fellowship. Um, in addition to banning TV and radio and news, she arranges marriages, separates children and parents, uh, children from their parents, uh, dictates when couples can get married, have sex or not have sex, have children. Um, and one of their main tenets is blasting, which is kind of screaming the demons out of their congregants. Um, and that it goes on for hours. Uh, so that's kind of just, <laughs> just a little nutshell tidbit. Um, <laughs> but so let's start with you, <laughs> Dr. Cohen. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you get interested in cults? <laughs> what brought um, you? I did not belong to one, nor do I. I want to start <laughs> with that. Um, I'm from uh, Western Massachusetts originally. I came to Clemson in 1995 for a year and stayed for 25. Um, and I've always been interested in what I call the religion of the pew, people's version rather than the pulpit um, leaders. And uh, I teach a course in religion, cults, secret societies, and conspiracy theories for the Honors College at Clemson. And um, it fills in usually in about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, they enjoy it. And Fox News even came in and covered it one day. So that shows you how important it is on the big you know, screen, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> um, how, how did you get this, the course, Religion, Cult, Secret Societies, into Clemson to start with? I, how did that end up being a part okay. of it? Well, I taught it for Osher Lifelong Living Institute for one uh, session, just as a, a thought, and they loved it. And um, I used to be the associate director of the Honors College, and they're always looking for honor seminar. So I wrote it up and presented it. And um, I have to say this, the head of the honors college had one question for me and he said, um, it's Bill Lasser. He said, Peter, I noticed one of your books you have for reading is um, Cults and Secret Societies for Dummies. Uh, isn't that a little, and I said, Bill, you went to Harvard, didn't you? He said, oh yeah. He's, I said, it's required reading for their course at Harvard, and that shut him up pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> so it's very timely, obvious, uh, obviously. And uh, for those of you that have read the book, um, the watchdog organizations that look for groups like this have counted something around 10,000 active cults in the country presently. Oh. So this is not an aberration. These uh, groups are going on all around us. That's scary. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just, just, just a little scary. Um, uh, for the, for those that are watching, cults versus religion. What is the difference between the two? How you know? How do you say something is a cult versus? Okay. Originally, the term cult referred to almost anything having to do with religion, uh, like cultic objects, a goblet or a vestment. 
but around the 1960s, when we saw proliferations of groups uh, like the Moonies and others, um, it became a type of mark for a new religious movement that many uh, established religions felt, um, you know, that was a problem. And there are many questions that rise up. The government immediately questions them for one reason or another. And um, uh, there's a quote uh, from a film I mentioned to you, uh, Cult's Dangerous Devotion, is one man's um, cult is another man's religion, which is very true. Um, people don't know they're in them very often. They accept the teachings as legitimate. And in many cases, um, you know, hopefully we'll see in a few minutes, there's a very thin gray line between what you may have in a church synagogue or a mosque and a cult. It can shift very quickly depending upon leadership and the times we live in. Yeah, because um, like with the world with the world of faith fellowship, it felt like when I was reading this book um, that it started out more religion based. With it had it had the blastings, but it seemed to have delved into the cult field where it was just more malicious over the years. Did you well, find it the way, or do you, do you imagine it was always that that because? Well, what happened was um, uh, Jane Whaley was a math teacher who actually went to Appalachian State, where I taught for two years, but this was well before <laughs> that. Then she wait, went to Tulsa with her husband, and he studied for the ministry there at a school. And you'll be happy to know that she was a math teacher and he was a used car salesman. So that's the background of the leadership for this community. Um, and that combined, she claimed, and this is a big problem. She claimed that God spoke to her and selected her as a prophet. Now we've had issues in a court of law. For instance, how do you disprove that? You can't disprove it. So things like this, do work um, in many ways. And then this uh, mixed with what she picked up in Oklahoma, the prosperity gospel was a teaching that's been around since last century that the more you give to the Lord, the more you will receive, the more you give to the church, the more you'll receive. And ultimately, it became this um, flow of money that came into her, which uh, helped her get all of the connections politically and in the community as well. And ultimately, her husband, Sam, was in the background, and okay. she was the leader of the church, uh, pretty much, and still is at 80 years old. Yeah. Um, with that flow of money, yes, uh, all the all the congregants were giving, and and they had to keep giving. I mean, um, in the book, it mentions the fact that basically uh, there was a predetermined amount of money that they were supposedly supposed to give every time, and basically they keep blasting and keep preaching until the coffers were full. They would keep repassing the offering plate. Right. Um, um, and then somebody counted the time. time and they, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just to show all of our churches, synagogues, and mosques, we do have um, membership fees. We do have building uh, funds, et cetera. And um, very often the, they become exorbitant in cost. Um, this is not just something that happens in a cult setting. But when you have someone taking advantage of them, buying a huge home or someone locally, won't use names, but locally, not that far from where we're sitting, 
um, bought a jet uh, for multi-million dollars and said that he could spread the gospel because of it. Wasn't that wonderful? And that you helped me, um, you know, get that. Um, you know, these are realities we have to watch for. Hey, um yeah, um, Michael says somebody claiming to talk to any deity or being a prophet is a red flag, period. Um, I would say it's a whole series of red flags. <laughs> um, anyone, um, the term I use very often is you get in a, um, a discussion with someone and when it gets to the point where they say, well, God told me there's actually a, um, a house episode uh, for those of you that have ever watched House yeah. um, in which he is treating a young boy who is a minister um, and as he's leaving the hospital he checks in with this boy and he asks him um, listen you claim to heal people correct he says well yeah I do and House says well, have you ever done any longitudinal tests on them to see if they've remained healed? And he said, well, I don't have to. And he says, why? And the response is, well, God told me they're healed. And House in his inimitable fashion goes, ah, the G word, and leaves, knowing full well that that's the end of the discussion. There's right. just no, no more after that that someone claims to have a direct discussion. Um, what... Like you did mention, yes, we do tithe to our church, and and that's understandable because you have to keep the 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 buildings going, the the outreach, everything like that. What are the main signs that you see that make a make it not a church and not a true religious faith that they're more in the cult and in it for? Okay, nefarious you can look. Purposes? You can look online and find anywhere as many as 30 characteristics. The best, smallest list I've ever found is from this gentleman I mentioned before, Dr. Robert J. Lifton, who said there's three major characteristics for a cult. The first is that there is a guru, someone who is worshiped, raised up on a pedestal, everything they say, has to be done, everything they do has to be followed, their worship, not the principles that they have originally espoused. Uh, the second of these three is that there is thought reform-like characteristics, uh, systematic indoctrination with a great emphasis on confession, criticism and self-criticism. And the third is heavy exploitation from above. Often that can take the form of financial or sexual exploitation. Now, if you look at those three things, and please don't misunderstand me, I'm not accusing any church or church leader, but often the leaders are put up on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. teachings of a church, of a synagogue, mainline or whatever, that's thought like reform by definition. And um, exploitation from above is where it changes. That's when, it, you know, uh, people take advantage of things. And it's so easy. Um, I grew up in the Northeast at the time when the issue with Catholic priests and pedophilia came up. Mm -hmm. Well, I got news for people. That's not the only religious community it's come up in by any stretch. It's gone into the Jewish community, into the Islamic community as well. And here are religious leaders trusted by their congregation who are exploiting them for one reason or another. And I think that's when things turn. Well, you know, and that I think that that's the problem. That's the main problem that I have with it. I, when 
if I, if I was a leader of this, I would think to myself, then we need to get him out of here. He needs to be, uh, you know, this person who is, who is a predator needs to not be a part of my organization anymore. He needs to not be around children. He needs to be prosecuted. And we are going to lead the charge on that. I, I, it just baffles me that instead it's closed ranks, move them somewhere else. Let's just not tell anybody. And let, like, I, I, is it just that they're worried that then their pull is going to lessen? Well, I grew up in a very Catholic neighborhood in Western Massachusetts. I was brought up Jewish. The priest in town, the sheriff, local sheriff, on 60 Minutes, mind you, said, we know he is guilty of murdering an altar boy. We just can't prove it. And this kid lived a stone's throw from my house, and he was one year older than I was, well aware of everything. And that priest was moved about four miles to another parish. And this was the problem that the Boston Globe first uh, uh, brought attention to. But again, these people of power have great power uh, in their community. Who's going to turn in a religious leader? The guilt with that, even if it's apparent. And um, I saw one of the um, recordings on YouTube about the world of faith fellowship and a young girl was crying because as she was interviewed saying her parents called one of the ministers to come in at night to blast her and for hours she was beaten and she can't believe her parents didn't protect her and she carries this with her for 20 years later um and it's, and it was you know, done as, and it was done as part of their faith. It just, uh, but it, it also felt like in the book that, or you know, in the in the book and in what life is for these these people that are a member of this, is that they're isolated and they're all supposed to tell on each other. So yes. they also have no one that they can go to. Uh, for help because they don't know anybody in the outside world because they're not allowed to. Siblings would tell on siblings. There's the case of the two brothers that um, um, went to college or wanted to go to medical school, but one didn't get in. And um, Jane wouldn't let the other go to medical school because of it or either of them because she wanted them to report on each other. Then she would raise people up as ministers within the church and their job, they were assigned a family. And if the parent reported to them that a child did something, had a demon within them for one reason or another, um, it was their job to beat the demon out. Um, and the talk about uh, bruises something that's not in the book that I saw just the other night, there was a um, podiatrist in the church who operated on church members uh, because one girl, you know, had a limp and he said her Achilles tendon needed to be extended. And she had like 30 operations by this guy. And she says, you know, it's something wrong when you have, you know, 150 people in a room and 50 of them have had ankle surgery and the parents would have to pay for it, of course. Right. And um, so she's physically as well as psychologically marked, you know, for life. And that doesn't come up in the book, but, no. you know, that, that was part of the community or is part of the community. Um, Beth had a good question. How common is it for women to assume the role of the cult leader, especially in affiliation with a religious organization? Um, very, very common. Really? Uh, there's um, Elizabeth Prophet uh, is someone not too long ago 
who um, started a group who whistleblower happened to be her son, but of course, really? uh, but uh, yeah, you know, it's whoever will listen. And sometimes a woman is seen as a more pure person. So their teachings about things are listened to more. Whereas in some cases, more um, traditional churches may not listen to a woman. Right. You know, and so you just don't know. It, it can be anyone. That's the thing. And I want to make it clear these people who join these groups are not crazy. These are people like you and I. These are people that are looking for community. They're looking to better their lives. They're looking for structure in their lives that they may not have. And uh, that quote I mentioned to you a few minutes ago beforehand, nobody sets out to join a cult. People join a new religion, work for a cause, start a political movement, and then all of a sudden they see things changing. And more often than not, they don't even see them changing. It's so subtle that they're part of it. Uh, so yes, women have historically been involved um, as much as men. Yeah. Um uh, Speechless, are you? I am. I, it's just, I, I really, I guess I get, I, I really didn't think that that many women were, but I, I guess it is because in traditional religion, not necessarily. <laughs> um, well, very often sure. it's the women who are exploited by the men who are leaders, who uh, oh. very often the leaders say that they cannot have marital relationships with their husbands, but the leader can. Um, the case of uh, Jane Whaley, um, people on their wedding night weren't allowed to have sexual relations. And go ahead. They're only allowed to kiss and godly hug. Right. In the case of Suzanne Cooper, um, is you know when she had her ninth child um that's when jane whaley really turned on her because she wasn't given permission to have another child and um things got ugly you know at that point um it, it kind of seemed like that was in the um the timeline where all of a sudden it became they had to tell you even when you could have sex yes as a, as a married couple when when it was that she was on to child number nine. Um, and then you have the whole um, exploitation of the children who are forced to work in church owned businesses, the people in the church own them and they're not paid. So they go to church once or twice a day, yeah. go to school and then work for hours and are just absolutely exhausted. And this is a vicious circle that wears them down. And ultimately, if they do something wrong, hey, they're separated from their parents and put in to someone else's home. Right. So for a year at a time, and this isn't the, you know, the story about the five boys yet, right. that's a whole other issue, yeah. but, um, you know, if someone goes against their parents, well, we'll take them out of the parents' home and put them into someone's home that can watch them better. Yeah. Horrible. Um, and just a reminder for anybody who has a question or a comment, uh, be entered for a uh, coffee, uh, for Ninja Warrior coffee. Um, I, because you did mention the five boys. Yeah. Um, do you want to tell a little bit about that from your, <laughs> uh, what you read or, or what, what were your thoughts on the five boys? That, for those? Well, just so everyone knows, there were five um, young men, boys, who, like boys that they are, they would 
smile at each other, uh, make hand gestures during class or during church, and just get under the skin of Jane or whatever. And they were sent ultimately to a room that was a renovated, not even renovated, a storeroom um, on the property where they lived for a year. They would get the food thrown in like it was a cell. They would have a gentleman come in and blast them. They would either listen all day to Jane's sermons or see recordings of them. And this was their existence for an entire year. And the people that were sent to, the, to this particular room um, never knew when they could get out. It was like, you're there. Yeah. You are, it's not even shunning. It's, nope, you're sent there. And sometimes they don't even know why. Right. Um, and just horrific. Just horrific. And like you said, for even, even just boys being boys, kids being kids, laughing and enjoying their life as children should do. <laughs> they were punished for that. And um, but it, it seemed like the only way that they might would be able to leave every once in a while is if they had to work for somebody. And so um, we- Well, we in, those, it, in their cases though, it was usually, they were there. They were there. In, in that room, that was kind of like, was. you know, solitary confinement, but at least the five of them were together, but they were watched. Right. Uh, but just, you know, imagine, you know, a, a weird comparison is the poor children today, let's say a child starting kindergarten or freshman year of college that aren't getting the socialization that they should be getting are in front of a Zoom screen or something like that but multiply that times the nth degree right? Uh, and the um, corporal punishment that went with it uh, is just unbelievable. Yeah. Um, in many of the uh, recountings of, because this book was um, interviewed, uh, it was done by Associated Press um, authors and they interviewed for years. Yeah. Two years, they interviewed hundreds of members that had left. Um, uh, all the uh, organizations that had either not helped and helped um, the members leave. Uh, so there's a lot of first head accounts um, with exactly what had, was done to many people, what they had seen, and just so that people do know, they were like taught, you know. It, even small children were blasted. It wasn't like just teenage boys that were being, you know, the ones that were blasted. We're talking about toddlers. We're, I mean, one of the scariest um, episodes is a young girl um, who sees her two year old brother being held by her mother hearing all of the blasting going around and, and children have sensitive ears and immediately started startled and started crying out. So what did people do? They turned and blasted the child for hours. And she talks about her brother turning white and crying till he passed out. This was done not just to kids or adults, it was done to babies. Um, it's just incredible, yeah. absolutely incredible. And um, and there are certain people like uh, Danielle, um, she is one of the, the members who, who did finally escape. She, as a child, did um, tell a DSS worker everything. Um, she wasn't supposed to, <laughs> um, they told her not to, she mm -hmm. said she dressed up and she, she's like, this is my only chance. And so even as a child, she told them she did not want to be there. It was horrible and what all they had done to her, but the nothing, she ended up not getting out until she was what, 19? The, 
the laws that they got changed because of the influence this group had on the local government because of money um, is scary. It is. Um, it basically, if a person goes to a, a clergy person to talk about abuse, the clergy person is supposed to, in 49 states, turn that other person in. Not in North Carolina now. Um, and um, they got other laws changed, um, much like, it's kind of mentioned just uh, in a moment, but the Church of Scientology in our country was recognized finally as a religion uh, because the government was tired of being sued. That's well proven. And the um, you know prosecuting attorney um, in a number of cases said, we're just tired of trying uh, because they would bring it literally from New York, the lawyers, that did this for the Church of Scientology to bring all kinds of suits to wear them down. So when they started a um, some kind of investigation, they were hitting a brick wall time and time again. Either the lawyers would come in or the uh, children that were bringing charges changed their story because it was found out and, you know, they got blasted so many times and, you know, weakened uh, yeah. by the church. Um, it's just so sad. Oh, by the way, we haven't mentioned the two or three people that died. You know, that's, you know, um, there are a few people that did die in this story. Um, you know, don't think that stop that, you know, simple blasting. Um, one person was, um, uh, died because of a shotgun shot to his chest uh, and it was ruled a suicide, yeah. um, which is it, a good trick, a really good trick. <laughs> right. Shotgun to your chest. Yeah. And another person, this, mm -hmm. uh, clerk of courts, um, was uh, approached by someone that said she had a contract out on her and she ultimately died too. Um, and it, it's just amazing what happened with this, what is happening in this community. Um, and and the, the light was first shined on this um, organization in 95. Correct. Um, in case you, <laughs> in case y'all haven't watched it, I'll put it in the, in the, um, links later, a uh, YouTube link to the Inside Edition 95 piece. Um, and it just, it shows the blasting. Um, and that's pretty much all it shows in that. But you you would have thought that something that, that would have changed some kind of trajectory for them. But um, in the courts, it, it really didn't. It didn't seem to make any difference at all. Um, and Jane saw it as a win. Um, and basically, I think that that's also when she made them, the uh, congregants, even more secluded. They weren't allowed to watch TV. They weren't, that's, it seemed like that that's when the edict of, you know, it's all lies. You can't watch this because they're just, you know, and then she presented it in a different format to them. And when she, was actually in court, of course, she claimed First Amendment, freedom of yeah. religion, you know, um, that the government cannot limit religion. And um, this is a very good case, people, that um, we should take a look at religious communities somewhat. I'm not saying to shut people down, but when they're given um, a status whereby their books can't be checked at all. Um, their finances can't be checked because there's a 
501c3, according to the Internal Revenue Service. Um, and one of the things that they were caught with is running a scam for the church members that were claiming that they were firing the children that were too old, uh, too young to work anyway, and they were claiming unemployment. Right. Um, and they caught the lawyers in the church doing this also. Um, but um, yeah, there, there's and so it, much that they were hiding behind. Yeah, and, and it's are. one of the young group that, you know, and just to show how um, persuaded they were, uh, it was what the Cooper boy, Jeffrey, who was the oldest, he was the one who, um, being that he had a law degree, <laughs> when he found out about the insurance scam, his mind thought Jane doesn't know. See, so it's kind of like in my mind, I also kind of thought that's who I would be. And like, she doesn't know we need to tell her so that we can get this fixed. We can get this out. We, you know, we can rectify this so we can continue on our path of, uh, you know, but he got in trouble <laughs> for bringing it to her attention because she already knew. Um, well, you couldn't bring anything to her. You prideful. couldn't bring anything to her attention. You couldn't question her, can't question her. Um, this is a person who is beyond reproach. Right. And she would be the one very often who would begin the blasting from the pulpit um, and would just pick someone out of the crowd. People would be shocked. What's going on this week? Um, and boom, there it would happen. Um, amazing. Um, and as of now, like you, you mentioned, there's only the uh, insurance fraud or, you know, unemployment insurance fraud. Um, he is in jail, but only he, for 34 months, I think is what he got for. Um, I think he it said he had, he had been committing it since 2008 to 2013. And he got 34 months. What's a, what's a decade or so? Come yeah. on. <laughs> Um, and I think his his wife got something, but it was very minor because uh, I believe that was the Covington family. Yeah, the sentencing um, was shocking. You know, right. $468 for basically kidnapping and beating. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, that's about right. You know. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so... Do you think that, uh, you know, this this book came out in February? Um, yeah. I also watched the, the the clips on, you know, the the two of the Cooper boys were on with the author um, on the Today Show in February talking about everything, um, the more dire things that have happened. And, you know, I know we've had COVID, but it's still, <laughs> you know, oh, we're, oh, we're now oh, in September. Their church has had COVID also. Right. They've had people in the church and supposedly they've been doing the proper mitigation for it. But no, there have been at least uh, publicly three people who have had COVID in the community. So the chances of more being the case is far greater because they have over 500 people at services. They're on private property. Right. Therefore, no one can stop them. They have security there, by the way. They're about an hour and a half from this library. Um, you go up 85, hang a left on 221, go up into Rutherfordton County, and that's where they are. Um, these groups are among us. Yeah. I, I can't you know, state that more clearly. Well, uh, not to just talk on that. How, how do, how did you, how do you see them compared to Scientology or Nexium? the, um, uh, uh, Jones okay. Town. <laughs> Jones Town. Many of these groups um, are what's called apocalyptic in nature. And um, the teachings of their groups all kind of uh, revolve around certain characteristics. Uh, the first one is that there is a kind of dualism 
in the community. In this case, demons. You're doing something wrong, it's demons. You don't think you're doing anything wrong, it's the demons making you think you're not doing anything wrong. <laughs> you name it. It's the outside community. They, they stopped an actual six part documentary being shown mm. on television by saying that the uh, People magazine was paying people to give interviews. So people backed off. That's the kind of power they had because they didn't want their reputation sullied. Not only is there this idea of dualism, but between this world and the next world, there is an understanding of a resurrection of the dead and a final judgment. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if you lived life well, you would be saved. If you didn't, it's obvious, okay? Uh, the third part is the most important one, the characteristic. The end is near. It's, we're living on the cusp. Things are gonna happen. People are going to come at us, whatever. Um, the fourth is that there's an appearance of an eschatological figure, a figure representing the end, a prophet, a self-proclaimed prophet, I might add in this case. Yes. And then the fifth one is that it's all contained in an apocalypse, a, a story that is told in the community. And what was consistently told to people, still is in the community and to these other groups, is that you want to end up on the right side of things. Mm -hmm. If you don't act properly, clearly the demons are taking you over. Mm -hmm. If you leave the community, in one point um, she has everyone in the congregation pray for the destruction of a former member. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. Um, one of the more Christian moments right. uh, in the uh, book. And that since they're no longer in this protected community that will give them eternal life, they are gonna die and won't have eternal life. So it's this you know, constant playing on emotions and passions and that's the one thing a lot of people forget about religion, the passion involved, mm -hmm. um, how important it is to someone. Um, the most you know, fervent believer, it's part of who they are. So when you right. take that away from them, they're at a loss. And this is what some of these leaders are doing. They're actually you know, saying, nope, sorry, yeah. you're out, or if you go too far, you've gone too far, or whatever. Um, so it's very similar to a lot of these communities. Within Scientology, every time you reach a level, you have to reach another level. Every time you give some money to be audited a certain amount, there's more to give. Uh, three collection plates, a service. Um, when people can't afford anything, they're still expected to give to the community. Um, when you have a, a church or other organization in our culture and mainstream, you know, someone will meet with you from the congregation and says, we understand you're having a bad year. You know, this year, we're going to lower the expectations. Right. No, no. In a community like that, this year we're going to expect more out of you because last year you didn't give enough. And um, literally give until it hurts right. and hurts a lot. Um, the Cooper uh, family, they filed bankruptcy, but yet he was still giving ties. <laughs> like where the money was coming from, who knows? probably unemployment, um, but uh, he was still tithing because he owed $300 minimum or $3,000, yeah. whatever it was a month that they had to do. Well, if you watch some 
some televangelists, I'm not saying all of them, but you know, um, was it John, um, I forget the um, commentator who uh, joined a church, created a church and basically um, the church he joined originally said, now, if you give us this money, we're gonna send you money, but don't give that away. Give us other money and back and forth. <laughs> and um, oh, it's a scam. Yeah. Uh, buy this holy water. Oh, I okay. Like buy water. this, um, you know, these drops of sweat from Jesus. Um, you know, and all of this uh, different things. And you see the old, especially, you know, older people that are on a fixed income, giving money to organizations that they can't afford to give money to, but they're guilted into it in many cases. And you know, shame on these people who do it. But, you know, uh, it needs to be much stricter than a shame situation. Right. But, but even all the money aside, the, the true crimes that have been committed are just like almost an aside. <laughs> it, it, it's like there's, they, they committed so many atrocities towards children and, um, you know, not letting people leave, uh, not letting them own stuff so they can leave. Um, if they try to literally the cars, taking a woman's children, yeah, and because she was proven to be um, to the social services by the church, not able to take care of her own children, she was kicked out of the church. Her children are in it, and she ended up in prison uh, for you know yeah. um, issues, etc. Um, the things they did, there was just no, yeah. they no boundaries. Her sister to say that she had abused, the, that it was all her and she was unfit. Um, yeah. And uh, it's, it's just, <laughs> um, it's baffling that it, and it's still current. <laughs> it's not, we're, we're not discussing, you know, Waco. <laughs> <laughs> discussing something that's long ago, like you said. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned Waco. In 1993, I had just gotten my PhD and I went home for vacation from grad school. And it was during the ATF and FBI's siege on Waco. And for some of you too young, they were playing some of David Koresh's sermons and things. And I turned slowly to my father and I said to him, this is not going to end well. <laughs> and he said, how do you know? I said, the rhetoric that's being given, these people are hoarding weapons. They are changing weapons to illegal type of weapons. Mm -hmm. And the language he's using is, we're not going to give up. And that that's Satan out in the parking lot. Oh, and by the way, if you ever watch any of the news around that time, um, there was a person sitting on the top of his car watching all this happen. His name was Timothy McVeigh, who was the Oklahoma City bomber. And this was also attached to what occurred at Ruby Ridge with the shootout there. Mm -hmm. So we have militias and events happening in our country that are interrelated. And interestingly enough, occur on the same day anniversaries that they are so interconnected uh, that people don't realize that. Um, and we see, you know, people like the FBI, ATF, taken advantage of and just not understanding the situation. They had a professor from North Carol University of North Carolina begging them to listen to Koresh, literally. Um, 
And um, they just didn't think it was important uh, that, you know, there's one guy in there, it's a small group of people, but it ultimately led to that group dying and how many hundred people at Oklahoma City, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <laughs> that's the good news. <laughs> um, uh, being that you kind of are up on the topic anyway, um, was there anything if, that they did tell in the book that surprised you that you didn't necessarily see coming as part of the cult or the inevitability of this? Not really. Uh, but then again, I must admit that on 9-11, I wasn't surprised either. I was just surprised at the extent of what occurred. Um, but um, here's a question for you, by the way. Um, in 1978, right before Thanksgiving, there were a number of people that died um, at Diana, People's Temple, Jim Jones. Mm -hmm. um, here, you should give a coffee cup to the person that gets this answer right. So everyone listen. How many people died at Jonestown on that day? Let's see if we get any answers in. Come on. Come on, somebody, or no somebody. one's listening. It says we got people watching. Anybody? Nobody. Nine, 908. It was the largest mass suicide in the history of our country. And it's an interesting picture. This is, let's see if I can get it so you can see yeah. it. Now it's in this front. is a picture of said minister, Jim Jones, less than two years before that horrific event in which a congressman was killed in the line of duty also, receiving the Martin Luther King Jr. Humanitarian Award. So you ask how things can change? Here it is. He was well-respected by many in the clergy. He had a very inclusive church um, that started in Indiana and moved to California, et cetera. And um, he later brought the people down to Guyana. He ended up being a drug addict and many other things. And many of those 900 people were forced, especially children, yeah. to take this poison mixed with um, juice it wasn't kool-aid you know we right. can't pin that on that company no. um, poor kool-aid <laughs> yes um and i won't say anything about that line that was recently said about someone drinking kool-aid we won't go there today uh but um these are people to be afraid of these are people that wield great power and congressman ryan that day was going to leave. He was going to come back to the United States with the people that were going back, but that's when Jones snapped. So beware. Um, beware of anyone that has every answer, that has everything you're supposed to do, no matter what, every instruction, I don't care who they are. And that includes parents, priests, prophets, professors also, <laughs> you name it. Um, because everyone and anyone that claims they know everything and has all this power is someone to be scared of, someone to be frightened of. There's no question about it. Well, I thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and I actually am going to draw the winner as uh, Michael Bryan is our winner tonight uh, for Coffee and Crying. Uh, thank you for so much for joining us tonight. Um, I really do appreciate it. And um, uh, are, are you still doing any of those Ollie classes for? I have been. 
<laughs> I haven't the past few years, but they all. <laughs> um, my late wife used to say my great groupies always wanted me to teach a course. These older women would take all these <laughs> courses. Um, and um, uh, by the way, for anyone that hasn't read, the book is a very good read, uh. it's well written. Uh, it's written for the general reader. It's not technical in any way. Um, I had not read it until Stephanie mentioned it to me. And um, it's very interesting on top of everything we've said. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to make that clear because the authors did a very good job. Yeah, they really, they really um, got the story from all angles. Yeah. I felt like um, but thank you again for joining us. Uh, just so that you know, uh, our next one is going to be the third Rainbow Girl, um, and Emma by Emma Cosplay um, Eisenberg, and she actually is going to be joining us for oh, that one. Nice. So uh, join us next time for our uh, October. This year's flown by. <laughs> but th thank you so much. Um, I truly appreciate it. And thank you all for joining in, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Stay safe and be healthy. <laughs>